the desert dark and drear Calling the sheep who've gone astray Far from the shepherd's fold away Bring them in, bring them in Bring them in from the fields of sin Bring them in, bring them in Bring the wandering ones to Jesus Who'll go and help this shepherd kind Help him the wandering ones to find Who'll bring the lost ones to the fold Where they'll be sheltered from the cold Bring them in, bring them in Bring them in from the fields of sin Bring them in, bring them in Bring the wandering ones to Jesus Out in the desert hear their cry Out on the mountains wild and high Hark, tis the Master speaks to thee Find my sheep where'er they be encourage you that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, tonight on what I have to say, but I do have something that I want to say that I think is very important, and it does go along with what we were talking about this morning. So if you open your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 19, Genesis chapter 19. Just as a on the side, uh, uh, as we were out in California and starting our first church out in, in the San Diego area, I certainly enjoyed going to preacher meetings. And so I would take my young son, Joshua, who's about five years old, and we would go out to preacher meetings. Sometimes it would take two or three hours to get to a, 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 a church that was hosting a preacher's meeting and stuff. And so Joshua heard a lot of good sermons when he was five years old. One night we were coming home from a preacher's meeting and we were talking. He's sitting in the front seat with me. I said, Joshua, I said, why don't you preach for daddy? He said, okay. And so he made a fist like this. And he said, that is sin. And he smashed his hand down on the dashboard really loud. I said, Joshua, daddy don't preach like that. He said, yeah, I know, but all the good preachers do. It's just amazing what kids can say, isn't it? Genesis chapter 19, and again, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Genesis chapter 19, beginning with verse number 1. Genesis 19, verse number 1. And Abram, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and then baked unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now verse number 12 of the same chapter. And the man said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring, out, uh, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because of the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Verse 15, And when the morning uh, arose, there, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. 
and verse number 16. And while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto them. And they brought them forth and set them without the city. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you again for this opportunity to be here tonight. Father, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Father, that you would give me clarity of thought and clarity of speech. God, I pray that I would only say the things that you want me to say. And Father, I pray that again that your Holy Spirit would touch each and every heart with your word. Father, among us are all kinds of needs, all kinds of worries in our own hearts. And Lord, only you can touch them. Only you can meet those needs. Only you can bring each, bring each one of us back to you in the way you so desire. And I pray that you would work a miracle work among us and in us this very night. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I've always asked myself as I, I study, as I read about Lot, is where was God during Lot's downward spiral. I mean, we, we read a lot about Lot himself being a just and righteous man. So where was God? When Lot was moving in the direction that he was moving, what was God doing? Is God up in heaven just oblivious to what is happening on, on our daily life? Now, I do realize there are some theologians... Actually, many of them who believe uh, that it's okay because uh, God had started the earth, but he's no longer involved in the affairs of men. And God is just too busy to spend any time with me. Uh, therefore, uh, God may have created everything, but he's not really interested in every single aspect of my life. Now, I don't believe that. I don't think that the Bible teaches that. In fact, I think it's just the opposite. Let me just say this. I think that God is very concerned about who wins the Super Bowl tonight. I don't have any doubt that God is concerned. You say, well, there, there are good Christians in Kansas City praying for Kansas City to win. And there are good Christians in San Francisco praying that uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco would win. How do you reconcile that? Well, I'm not God. I don't have to reconcile it. But I do, I do want to assure you of one thing, that, that God is not sitting up there in heaven saying, man, I don't want to watch the Super Bowl. Maybe I ought to turn the channel to, to, to the Cartoon Network or something. No, God is interested in every aspect of his creation. And that means those things. Well, well, I don't understand. How can God answer the request? We're not talking about God answering prayers. We're talking about God being actively involved in our lives. How does God take a person who, who has spent his entire life trying to get the Kansas City Chiefs back to the Super Bowl, is he going to grant that request and let them win? Or is he going to dash their hopes and let them lose? And it's the same thing over there in San Francisco. You know, I, I can't answer how God works, but I can be assured of one thing by the word of God, that whatever happens tonight, God will allow you to accept it for his purpose. Let us win or lose. He does that for me personally. He'll do that for you personally. And he'll do that for everybody in San Francisco personally. You know, this stuff that we walk around and talk about, well, God's not interested in a, in a football game. He's not interested in a basketball game. No, he's not interested in your job. He's not interested in your relationships. That can't be farther from the truth. That can't be so anathema to the word of God that, 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 that we ignore the providential care of God in our lives. And so the question automatically arises as we read about Lot, as we study Lot, where was God when Lot was going down his spiral? Well, we can, we can look at the history of Lot, and I know we looked at it a lot today, but I want to look at it tonight from a perspective of where God was. 
We already said that Lot lost his dad at, a, at an early age, that his grandfather had raised him until he died, and then, Lot had ta- uh, then Abraham had taken him to the land of promise. And Lot, being at his side, as we said this, this morning, when he, when he built the altar at, at, at Bethel, when he called upon the name of the Lord, Lot was there. When he went down into Egypt and came back, as we said this morning, Lot was, uh, Lot was there. He, he, he saw Abraham pray. And we already said, as we looked at the word of God, that God had already said that, that he knows Abraham. And Abraham will command his house, uh, his children and his house to obey him, to keep his commandments. So there's no doubt in my mind that Lot had a godly upbringing. There's no doubt in my mind that Father Abraham, the friend of God, had instructed Lot in the ways of the Lord. I, I don't doubt that in any way, shape, or form. Either that or, or God didn't know Abraham as, as well as he thought he did. So you, you say, where was God when Lot started his downward spiral? He was there. He was right next to Lot. God was using Abraham as his father, as his spiritual counselor. God was using Abraham to encourage Lot, to, to, to train Lot, to, 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 to guide Lot in the direction that he ought to go because Lot didn't listen to it. Or because Lot didn't want to entertain the thoughts of what God might want for his life, did not change the fact that God was there at his side. That God was telling Lot exactly what he wanted through the spiritual leadership that God had placed over him. And it's the same way today. God had given us spiritual leadership, even in our family, to lead us and guide us. And may I submit to you, even tonight, that even our immediate families, our, our parents and our siblings are, are used by God, whether they're saved or not. Let me tell you something, and, and this, is, this is hard to believe, and I realize we live in such a dysfunctional world today that when we talk about families, some people don't understand anything about a family. They never had a godly father. They never had a father who even loved them. And I understand that, but we're talking about a nuclear family, we're talking about how God had used even the unsaved. You know, uh, one of the things that I, I taught my, my girls, I have four girls, and they were all in Bible college uh, together, but at different uh, ages. And, and I always told them, I said, listen to your friends. If you're going to go courting someone, listen to what your friends say. Because love is blind. You, you're not going to see the faults of someone else, but... People who love you are going to pick out their faults really easy. And so listen to them. See, see, God uses those people around us. And I do agree that Lot, in his upbringing, he really never did anything in relationship to what Abraham uh, was uh, trying to teach him. But I want to assure you God was still there. That God was still using Abraham, that God was still using those people around him to encourage Lot, to train Lot, to, uh, to get Lot motivated to do what God wanted them to do. Lot didn't listen. So you come to Genesis chapter 14, and you can turn there. Genesis chapter 14, a, a verse we read this, this morning, and verse number 12. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son. Who took Lot? The, the kings that were fighting one against another. Now, now imagine, after Lot saying he wasn't going to dwell in Sodom, or Lot indicating he wasn't going to dwell in Sodom, and five years later, as we said this morning, he's dwelling in Sodom. So where was God? Huh? Well, there was these uh, evil kings, ungodly kings, kings that didn't recognize God himself who came down into Sodom and took everything and everybody captive. They went down there and they pulled Lot out of Sodom. And he started carrying him away. Could you imagine Lot there at night, chained by himself, wondering where his wife and his, and his children are, wondering what happened to his possessions? I'm just wondering what the conversation in Lot's own mind was going on. But he was physically removed from Sodom. 
by circumstances, by things beyond his control, by things he had no choice in the matter. These kings didn't come into Sodom and say, hey, anybody want to come with us into captivity? No, they physically took them out. And we, as we read the story, we're not going to continue, but as we read the story, we find out that Abraham heard of what happened a lot. So he gathered an army and he goes out there and he defeats all those kings. He frees and liberates Lot and his family. He liberates everything Lot had. Amen. But what happened then? Well, the Bible really doesn't say. But I'm sure as he were walking back to Sodom, what do you think the conversation was between Lot and Abraham? Were they silent the entire uh, uh, way back home? Did they not talk to each other through that time? No, there was a conversation. I don't have any doubt about it. Again, I, I refer you to Genesis uh, chapter 18. I know Lot. He will command his children and his household to obey me. So if God said this as a testimony to Abraham, again, there's no doubt in my mind that, that Abraham began to talk to Lot. Hey, Lot. I notice you're dwelling in Sodom. Is that godly? Is that what God wants you to do? Are you sure that you're not being tainted with the worldly influences of those wicked, deceiving sinners before the Lord? What was Abraham's response? I mean, uh, Lot's response. Oh, Father Abraham, this is a new age. You're just an old fogey. You don't understand the times that are happening. Uh, what's happening? Uh, you're, you're misunderstanding God's will. That's what you're doing. You can't tell me what God's will for my life is. And I'm sure the conversation was just like the conversations we have on a continual basis among us today. Where people get themselves all puffed up in a peacock and said, I am my own master, I will make my own decisions, and I will tell you what God wants me to do. It's like that guy when I was preaching out in, 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 the, in the Camp Pendleton in, the, in, in their brig. I had a man come up to me after, after the service and said, listen, I'm so excited, God's called me to preach. I said, well, praise the Lord. He said, but the problem is my wife doesn't want me to go into the ministry. So I think I'm thinking of divorcing her and marrying someone else. So what do you think of that? I said, I don't think that's even biblical in the, in the least bit. If God's called you to the ministry, he will call your wife also with you. And I will guarantee you, according to the word of God, he doesn't want you to divorce your wife. I'm going to do it anyway. Because I know what God's will for my life is. Really. God will never go contrary to his word. But the point I'm trying to make is that, that, that God was there. When Lot was dwelling in Sodom, guess who came in to Sodom? God. No, you said it was uh, those bad kings. Yes, it was. But who used those bad kings? God. You remember Habakkuk? You remember how he, he cried out to God, God, how come you're not judging Israel? I mean, uh, God, we're just wicked. Uh, uh, we're doing all kinds of bad things, and, and you, just, you just seem silent. You're not judging us. And God says, hey, listen, I'm going to judge Israel. I'm going to bring the Chaldeans down, and they're going to wipe you out. And what did Habakkuk say? What? You're going to take an evil nation and, and judge us because of that? God says, I'll use whoever I want to. And the point of the matter is, the circumstances in Lot's life was erected by God himself. So who pulled him out of Sodom? God did. God did. You know, I don't want to turn there, but I see this story over and over again throughout the Bible. But the two chapters that I think really spell it out would be Amos chapter 4 and Haggai chapter 1. Amos chapter 4, where, where the, the, well, he said he wasn't even a prophet, but the, well, the prophet Amos had begun to talk to Israel. And he said that God said, 
And he lists a whole series of places, uh, things that happen in Amos chapter 4. Cleanness of teeth, uh, lack of water, uh, uh, pestilence, uh, uh, the caterpillars eating your, your harvest, uh, uh, even the death of your children. And every single time something happened by chance in Israel, guess what Amos chapter 4 says? God says, I caused that. And you continue to read the verse and it says, yet have you not returned unto me? And then you go on and God says, he caused some other catastrophe. And God says, I did that. Yet you have not returned unto me. And it goes on and on and on about what God had done negatively that we say just happened by chance. And God says, I want you to know I did it. Yet you have not returned unto me. You go to Haggai after the exile when they were coming back and they started to build the temple of God and the people saw it because he had opposition. So God sent Haggai and Haggai began to preach and uh, he began to say, hey, you need to consider your ways. You need to think about what you're doing. And he said, listen, you go out and, and, and you get a job and, and you earn all this money and you put it into a bag with holes. Must be health insurance or something like that. But he, he puts all that money into a bag. And God says, there's a hole in your bag. So when you get home, you don't have any money. And you know what God says? Uh, hey, guys. I put the, ba- the hole in your bag. He said, you went out and, and, and you sold a whole bunch of seed. And, and the, the range came and you were looking for a good crop. And he said, and it just disappeared. It blew away. And God says, I blew upon that. God took credit for the bad things that happened in their life. Can I tell you that? So when you see what God had did in Genesis chapter 14 with Lot, how that God had allowed a, a, an evil nation, or actually four evil nations, to come down there and physically pick Lot up and his family and his possessions and take him completely out of Sodom. That just wasn't by chance. That just wasn't just bad luck on, on, on Lot's part. That was God's design. That was God's providential care over Lot. And yet he, he, he still refused. He still went back into Sodom. He still moved his family back. Or he did not listen to the counsel of his, of his adopted uh, father. He did not listen to the counsel of God. He did not listen to his own conscience. He did not recognize the sovereignty of God in the things that happened into his life. And so he continued down the same path. Then you come to Genesis chapter number 19. And again, as, as I mentioned this morning, there's a whole lot of things that we can go through. Uh, and there's a whole lot of decisions that, that we can make. And a whole lot of things that God shows himself in control over the affairs of our life. But we can only highlight, we can only give the glimpses of what had happened. So, you, so as you turn back to Genesis chapter number 19, and you know the story. I purposely did not read it this morning because... It's not a very nice story. I mean, in our generation, in our time, to do what Lot wanted to do to protect these visitors, I could not ever see myself or most of us ever coming to that position to want to sacrifice your own daughters for such such evil. But the point I'm trying to make is that these angels were sent by God. And what did they do? They went directly to Sodom. They went and visited Lot. And they told Lot, hey, God's going to destroy this whole place. You need to get everybody you know out of this city before we destroy it. Abraham, as we read, went to his son-in-laws and said, hey, listen, you need to get up. God's going to destroy this place. Abraham believed Lot, did he not? I mean, God, Abra, uh, Lot believed God. And so Lot went to his uh, sons-in-law and said, Hey, listen, God's going to destroy this city. His son-in-law said, Oh, you're just an old fogey. What you're saying is just, is just simply not true. Why would God, a, a God of love, 
destroy so, so many people. You, you, you misunderstand God. And, and he seemed to them as, as one that mocked. And so they just refused to listen to him. And so when he got up in the morning and, and uh, they were getting ready to go, uh, the verse you want to look at is verse number 16. And while he lingered, he already believed he was a just man. When those angels came and told him God's going to destroy this city, they believed him. I mean, Lot believed him. He didn't hesitate. He tried to get his, his son-in-laws. He tried to get his daughters that were married to him. He tried to even get his wife to understand that God's going to destroy this place. Lot knew all that stuff and still he, he lingered. Isn't that amazing how, how he would linger like that? You know, we can look at so many different, different things, you know. But the truth of the, of, the, of the matter is, he lingered. Lot knew the awful condition of the city in which he stood, yet he lingered. The Bible says because the cry in Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, and yet Lot lingered. Uh, the Bible says that those of Sodom spread their sinful practices into the entire culture so that both young and old, all people from every quarter joined in participating in their wicked deeds. And yet he lingered. Lot knew the fearful judgment coming down on all within his walls. And yet he lingered. Lot knew that God was going to keep his word. And yet he lingered. Lot believed there was danger because he went to his son-in-laws and warned them, and yet he lingered. Lot saw the angels standing by, waiting for him and his family to flee, and yet he lingered. When it was time for decisive action, Lot lingered. When Abraham was praying for him, he lingered. When the heavenly messengers, these angels, were urging him to go, he lingered. When judgment was imminent, he lingered. His desire for the comforts of Sodom overruled the revelation of the angels about judgment. So he lingered. I mean, we can go on and on about this. He had grown too familiar with Sodom. Rather than being repulsed by it, he lingered. You know, God's silence does not necessarily mean he does not care about our attitudes and our actions. You know, in Psalm 50, verse number 21, These things thou hast done, God said, and I kept silence. And thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. One commentary said, Because God did not interpose openly to punish the sins committed, the transgressor dared to imagine him to be indifferent to sin. And then another commentary said, But they misinterpreted his non-interference as an indication that he regarded sin even as they did. Sinners take God's silence for consent. And so you see Exactly what has happened. Has Lot lingered? Has he hesitated? Has he delayed? Even listening to God through the angels. So where was God? Right there. In the midst of Lot with the angels. Encouraging him. And pleading with him. Imploring him. To flee. So what happened? Did he... Did he flee? Not on his own. The angels came, grabbed him by the hand, and literally took him out of the city and took his wife out of the city and his two uh, daughters out of the city. Why? Because the Lord being merciful unto him. See, Lot was a just man. Where was God? God was always there in the circumstances of Lot's life. God was always there leading and guiding through the things that fell upon Lot. 
And yet he just refused to see it. He became so accustomed to what is happening around him that he did not spend time with God to find out what God wanted. And the point of, the, uh, of my message this evening is not so much to be negative in relationship to us lingering, but to acknowledge the fact that God is at our side. He's always at our side. He has never left us. The moment we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we became his child. And as his child, he is always and forevermore our Heavenly Father. And he will not leave us alone. <coughs> he will not forsake us. He is there. You say, well, what about all those circumstances? What about all those bad things? Whom the Lord loved, he re loveth, he rebuketh, does he not? I mean, the Bible says, if you be with that child's husband, of which all the children are partakers, then you are not sons. And God's rebuke through the circumstances that we come up, that come upon us. God is dealing with us to bring us back to him. God is dealing with us to direct us in the right area. God is striving to get a hold of our hearts. And many times we don't even say that. When, when you go through Amos and you read a little bit of the history of Amos and you see what's happening in Amos ch ch chapter 4, the point of everything that God did, if, if you read that and you see that God started out with, oh, uh, without water, and then he started out with a famine. Then he started out with a, 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 a cleanness of a, a bread. He started out with these things. Each time God judged, the judgment became more and more severe. But after the first judgment, just a, a lack of water, God says over and over again, yet ye have not returned unto me. And the indication was in Amos chapter 4 that if the Israelites would have came back to God, would have stopped on the direction that they were going, that uh, everything would stop. Their circumstances would change. But they refused. So God tightened the screws a little bit more. And still they refused. So God tightened the screws a little bit more. And still they refused. Why is that? Because God loved Israel. And God loves each one of us. And sometimes when we go through these things that we find miserable and impossible for us to endure, it's not God judging us. It's not God being angry at us. It's God loving us. It's God saying, hey, I love you so much. I don't want you to live out there. I want you to live underneath the cross. I want you to live next to me. And out of his love for us, we fall through these things. You think that God, after he took uh, Lot and his family out of, out of uh, uh, Sodom in Genesis chapter 14, and, and, and Lot refused to listen, that God said, well, I'm done with you? Well, then why did he bring the angels to get them out? And even when he brought the angels, and Lot believed the angels and said, yes, yes, I know God's going to judge this place. I know God's going to bring judgment on this place. He still could not bring himself to leave. And so God, through the angels, grabbed his hand physically and pulled him out of Sodom. Why? Because God loves us. God loves us. And he's never left us. And he never will leave us. And if we're going through tough times, it's not God judging us. It's God loving us. I, for several years, I, would, I, I try to read the Bible through, at least yearly. And uh, for several years, I would take a pen and I would, I would begin to write down every place where God says that when he judges us, he gives us our own desires. Every time. So God's judgment upon people is to give them what they want. Isn't that sad? Because once we actually get what we want, we realize it's not what we wanted. And so God's judgment upon people is give them what they want. It's God in his love that hinders the direction we're going. It's God in his love that directs us through the circumstances of our life. That's what he does to each one of us. Out of anger, 
No. Out of judgment? No. Out of love. Out of love for each one of us. So I just want to say tonight that if we're going through some tough times, it's not out of anything but love that God has for each one of us. And if we would sit and reflect and ask God, what would thou have me to do? He will lead us. He will guide us. He will get us to overcome those things that we find impossible to understand today. Why? Because he loves us. So tonight, I just want to tell you, God loves us. And he will lead us and he will guide us. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we will be going through, he's still at your side. He's never left you. He's never left Lot. He loves each one of us. And we need to be assured of that. Let's pray. Father, we... I'll stay in the